again, church family. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. If you have your copy of God's Word, and I pray that you do, I'd invite you to open to the book of Esther. Uh, we're going to be reading out of chapter 4, a uh, chapter, a little bit out of chapter 5, and a little bit out of chapter 7 this morning. Um, but we're going to be focusing on Esther chapter 4. Uh, if you're using one of our Black Pew Bibles, and I know some of you might be, it's on page 412 of that Black Pew Bible. On the morning of June 5th, 1989, photographer Jeff Widener was perched on the sixth floor balcony of the Beijing Hotel. This is a day after the Tiananmen Square massacre where Chinese troops attacked pro-democracy demonstrators that were located on the plaza. Uh, the Associated Press sent Widener there to document the aftermath. As he photographed uh, bloody bodies and scorched buses and the occasional pedestrian uh, walking by, he, he suddenly saw a column of tanks begin to roll out on the plaza. Now, uh, immediately he, he took his camera and, and he focused his lens on these tanks when suddenly a man stepped out carrying shopping bags. He stood in front of the tanks. Now, the tanks tried to go around him, but the man kept moving in front of the tanks. They couldn't get around him. He even jumped up on top of one of the tanks at one time. Now, Widener assumed this man would be killed, but the tanks held their fire. Uh, they didn't shoot him. Uh, but eventually, the man was whisked away, but not before Widener uh, was able to immortalize uh, this singular act of courage with his camera. His image was transmitted over the Associated Press wire and was on the front page of just about every uh, newspaper uh, in hours. Um, decades after the tank man became a, a global hero, he still remains unidentified. And it's the anonymity of this, of this photograph that makes it all the more universal. It is a symbol of courageous resistance to unjust regimes all over the world. We're in our sermon series called Superheroes, and we're looking at people in the Bible who exhibit traits that all believers have, and, and in ways in which we can cultivate these traits. Now, the trait that we're going to talk about today, as I said, is courage. Uh, there, is a, there is a real pandemic in this world where people display a lack of courage every single day. It's, it's a reason why we don't listen to each other anymore. It's a reason why we don't face problems like we used to. It's a reason that we don't face up to reality and call things for what they really are. Uh, speaking of courage, uh, the first thing we think of is physical courage. We think of the athlete who pushes through the pain to win the contest, or the soldier who runs through a, a hail of bullets uh, to win the battle, or we think of the, 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 the cancer patient who, who battles long, hard months of chemotherapy, and these are acts of everyday courage, but that's not the kind of courage that I'm talking about. The kind of courage that I'm talking about is moral courage. It's the, it's the kind of courage that exposes you to ridicule and criticism and ostracism, and even the judgmental wrath of other people. It's the kind of courage that we find in the book of Esther. It's been preserved in God's Word for over 2,500 years. Now, as Trey said, Esther is unique because God's name is not mentioned one time. Neither is prayer. But we see God's hand at work. His fingerprints are all over the book of Esther. Now, if this book were not in the Bible, you would think that a Hollywood writer penned it. Uh, it's got intrigue, mystery, deceit, treachery, murder, uh, and it has a great twist ending. Uh, the, the story takes place in the ancient kingdom of Persia. Israel was taken into captivity by the Babylonians, who were then uh, defeated by the Persians uh, under the, uh, the, the rule of King Xerxes. He, he, was, uh, the, he was the biggest man at the time. Xerxes was the most powerful man in the world. He ruled what is now known as the Medo-Persian Empire, which stretched from modern-day Libya in Africa all the way to Pakistan in Asia. It was the largest 
uh, empire in history, with over 50 million people. Persia ruled the, the Middle Eastern world for 200 years. And, and in this setting, we have this little biblical Cinderella story of an unknown Hebrew girl who, through a mysterious turn of events, is chosen out of 25,000 women to become the queen of Persia, to marry the most powerful man in the world, and to save the Jewish people from total genocide. She has a cousin named Mordecai, and because Esther was an orphan, he adopts her and raises her as his own daughter. He enters her into, into a beauty contest to see who can become the queen of Persia. But he tells her not to reveal her Jewish identity because Jewish women were not allowed to become the Persian queen. But more important than that, we have a villain that enters the scene named Haman. Uh, he, he is the prime minister of the empire. He is uh, second in command only to Xerxes. Uh, he's a big jerk, uh, to, to put it bluntly. Uh, he wants everybody to bow down to him when he walks by, but Mordecai will not do it. Mordecai refuses to bow uh, to Haman. So Haman is infuriated. But what really makes him mad is when he finds out that Mordecai is a Jew. Because Haman is an Amalekite, and the Amalekites and the Jews had a Hatfield and McCoy feud that went back over a thousand years. So he decides he's going to not only take Mordecai out, he's going to take the entire Jewish nation out. He doesn't just hate the person of Mordecai, he hates the people of Mordecai as well. And he persuades the king to go along with this plan so that every Jew... Uh, man, woman, child, even ones that had returned to Israel are going to be annihilated. And Haman is going to end the Jewish race once and for all. This sounds familiar, doesn't it? Isn't it funny how history has a way of repeating itself? Because 2,400 years later, a dictator named Adolf Hitler came to power who tried to do the same thing. Haman is a proto-Hitler. He has manipulated the signing of a death warrant of the entire nation of Israel. It'll be genocide on an unprecedented scale. And the only thing that stands between the nation of Israel and total annihilation is a little Jewish country girl named Esther. So if you would, let's go into God's word, Esther chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 9 and read down to verse 17. Hear the word of the Lord. And Hathach went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathach and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, but there is, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these thirty days. And when they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do, then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can approach the throne of our king at any time through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that you are a benevolent king. You are a good, good father, one who loves his children, one who sacrifices for his children, and one who is loving, merciful, and gracious to his children. Lord, we thank you for the courage of Esther, and I pray, God, that as we delve into your word. I pray that you would speak deep into our hearts and lives and transform us into that which you would have us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Esther is the only person in the world who can change the king's mind and take tragedy and turn it into triumph. Now, 
we learn from this great woman what courage is all about. First, courage is showing up. That's the first step of courage, is simply to show up. When news gets back to Mordecai that a decree, an edict has been issued, he goes into a time of mourning. He, he, he collapses in, in, uh, in sackcloth and ashes, and he sits outside the city gate, and he wails and mourns. Now, when Esther hears this, she gets some of her attendants to find out some information because she didn't know anything about this plan. Mordecai then realizes that Esther is his ace in the hole. She's his, his, his way to get to the king. She may be the linchpin to get this whole mess straightened out. So he sends word to her about what's happened and tells her that she has to go into the presence of the king and beg for mercy to spare not only him, but the people of Israel. Uh, the problem is that isn't as easy as it sounds. Listen to what the word says. And Hathach went to Esther what more, and said what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathach and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one whom the king holds out his golden scepter so they may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. Now you're saying, wait a minute, she is the queen. She's the king's wife. It's his girl. What do you mean she can't go in there? There was no women's lib. There, there, there was no kind of gender equality back in those days. And even though that this was her husband, he was the king. And she couldn't just simply stroll into his presence. It didn't work that way back then. You couldn't just go into the office of the king without being invited. Uh, nobody had an open door. Not the prime minister, uh, not, not the queen, not the secretary of state. Nobody. There was a great fear of assassination in those days. People wanted that, they wanted that throne. And people would go to great lengths to kill the king to usurp his throne and become king. So he had his own little version of the secret service around him. If you wanted to see the king, you had to send a formal request, a formal note, and then you had to be formally invited to come into the presence of the king. When you went into the presence and you were invited, he would hold out his golden scepter as approval. If you walked in unannounced, there's a good chance that you would not walk out. You'd probably be carried out. So Esther now has to face a choice. She can stay in the comfort of that she has, has, I'm sure, grown to love. She probably had a Mercedes chariot and, and a Rolex sundial, and she probably liked them very much. Uh, she could have simply stayed where she was in the, in the comfort of the palace. She could have hidden the fact that she was a Jew, and she could have lived happily ever after. The only other option was to rise to the occasion, was to risk everything that she had to do the right thing, to say the right words, and to be the right kind of person that God wanted her to be. And Mordecai realizes the spot she's in and the decision that she has to face, and he makes one of the greatest statements that we find in the Bible. Verse 13, Then Mordecai came, or told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, Relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Adrian Rogers once said, It is costly to be courageous, and courage never goes on sale. There's times in your life when you are going to risk everything. There's times when, when fear is going to stare, stare you right in the face, and, and you're going to be frightened, and you're going to wonder, what should I do? Should I do the right thing? Of course, always. That's why the Bible tells us 365 times, do not fear, because fear paralyzes good people from doing good things. God said this 365 times because he knew that every day there is something that is going to make us fearful, that's going to make us want to crawl up into a ball and retreat from battle. And that's why the first step of courage is simply showing up. Brene Brown once said, sometimes the bravest and most important thing you can do is just to have the courage to show up and be seen when we have no control 
over the outcome. Listen, Mordecai told her, you're going to face the same thing as the rest of the Jews, but, but God's will will not be thwarted because God is sovereign. You have an opportunity to either, to either show up and do what you got to do, or somebody else is going to take your role. You see, when Moses was, was in the wilderness and he kept giving God all those excuses about why he couldn't go. Oh, oh, I have a speech impediment. Well, let me take my brother. Can't you send somebody else? Listen, if he had have had continued that, God would have used somebody else to deliver the Israelites. And if, if, if Esther had not stepped up here and did the right thing, God would have used someone else. Because God's promises are true. And God made a promise to Abraham that his people would bring the Messiah into this world. That his people would be a blessing to this world. Esther did the right thing. Courage is showing up, but courage is also standing up. One reason why courage is difficult is often you don't have time to think about doing the right thing, saying the right word, taking the right action when things are thrust upon you quickly and, and out of the blue. Esther didn't take long to decide. Verse 14 it says, then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. All of us have a, such a time as this moment where we have to decide on the spot if we're going to keep our seats, if we're going to stand up, if we're going to go with the flow, or if we're going to do the right thing even if we have to do it alone. Sometimes we have to take a stand even if we have to take a stand alone, to take the right path even if we have to take it alone. Courage is, is not the easy thing to do. Courage is not the popular thing to do. Courage is the right thing to do. Always doing the right thing. Esther knows that there's only one thing that she can do, and, and that's why God put her in role as queen to begin with. Maybe you're in a situation, you're saying, why did God put me in this situation? You may be an Esther. You, you say, well... I'm not going to save anybody's life. You may help save their soul. See, God has put you in the situation that you're in because you have a sphere of influence just like Esther found herself in. She had access to the most powerful man in the world. But she was a spokesperson for the ultimate authority, which is God himself. Now, you may say, well, well, God put me in this job. God put me in this marriage. God put me in this family. God put me in this circle of friends, and I don't know why. But chances are God wants you to tell those people about the Savior that the saved your soul, the Savior that you love so much. That God has put you for such a time as this into their lives because he wants you to speak the truth and love to them. Because, see, the one... A very important element to courage is to have faith and trust in God. Trust in his Holy Spirit to precede you and, and to give you the power and the words that you need to say. Courage is, the, is, someone said, willing to do what you know God wants you to do when the consequences are unknown. Oh, that's scary. But that's what courage is. Courage is always the hard way. And it's always the costly way. Now, between chapters 4 and 5, there's a three-day pause in the action. People are praying, and they're fasting, and Esther is looking to God. And we come to chapter 5, and verse 1, we read these words. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace, in front of the king's quarters, while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the royal room opposite the entrance to the palace. Now, if you, if you read that carefully, you realize she is not standing in the outer court. She is standing in the inner court. She doesn't know if she's going to live or die. Will the king hold out his gold scepter or not? Well, this teaches us that it's all in God's hands. Esther teaches us that courage is being willing to die to do the right thing. Courage shows up, courage stands up, and finally courage speaks up. Now, Esther has carried out this brilliant plan, and she exposes Haman and his evil, his evil plan. Before everybody, she makes this announcement in verse 7. I should say chapter 7, excuse me. 
So the king and Haman went into a feast with Queen Esther, and on the second day as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you, and what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be granted me for my wish, and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated. And if we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent. For our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Now, Queen Esther is Jewish. She's just exposed herself. Her family, her bloodline, her people are all Jewish. So the only one who could speak up, spoke up. Now, Xerxes had issued an order, and a king's orders could not be reversed. So he issues another decree. He gives the Jews the right to gather together, to arm themselves, and more importantly, to defend themselves. And when they do this, they kill over 75,000 Persians and in the process save an entire nation because of a woman who was willing to show up, stand up, and speak up. Winston Churchill once said, There comes a special moment in everyone's life, a moment from which that person was born, that special opportunity when he seizes it will fulfill his mission, a mission from which he is uniquely qualified. In that moment he finds greatness, his finest hour. And no doubt, this is Esther's finest hour. It's never been forgotten. In fact, there are three uh, celebrations on the Jewish calendar that, that they, they absolutely celebrate every year. The first one's Passover, uh, which is built around the Exodus, God's deliverance from Egypt. The second is Hanukkah, which is a remembrance of the victory of Judas Maccabeus over the Syrians and the restoration of the temple. And the third is the Feast of Purim, which commemorates an incredible woman named Esther, a woman who put God first, people second, and herself last. And she showed courage that is rarely seen. She is so revered by the Jews that in the synagogues, her story is read from beginning to end publicly. God raised up an Esther to preserve the very people who would bring the Messiah into the world. We see God's hand at work all through the book of Esther, even though we don't hear God's name mentioned. So how do we apply this? Well, there's four ways we apply this to our life. How do we cultivate this superpower? First, face your fears. I read an interesting story about the lions in, in, in Kenya and how they stalk their prey. The, the, the females actually do the killing rather than the males. They get the male out front, and, and, and the girls go behind. The girls flank uh, the, the, the prey. And the, the, the male lion roars with a roar that can be heard for five miles away. The prey turn from the roar, and they run back right into the mouths of the waiting lionesses. Now, to survive, they should have run into the roar, but they do just the opposite. There, there's, the best way to get rid of fear is to face fear. If you fail to face fear... Fear will follow you everywhere you go. Second, stand strong. We develop courage by deciding ahead of time the truth that is worth standing up for. Then, when that time comes, being willing to actually stand up for that truth. John Stuart Mill said in 1867, Bad men need nothing more to accomplish their ends than that good men should look on and do nothing. In other words, don't just stand there. Do something. Abraham Lincoln, when he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, he was told by politicians, he was told by powerful men not to do it, but he did what our founding fathers failed to do. He had the courage to end slavery. Third, respond righteously. Now, there are times when it takes courage to speak up. Someone once said, to sin by silence when they should protest make cowards of men, but sometimes we should practice the courage of staying silent, particularly uh, refusing to respond to personal attacks, to harsh words, to hateful language, and like kind. There's times when being silent is is prudent courage. Fourth, act alone. Be willing to stand up if you're the only person willing to stand up. 
because courage is counter-cultural. Uh, going against the norm is not easy. Someone once said that even a dead fish will float downstream. Mark Batterson, uh, the pastor and author, once said, One of my prayers for my children is that they will have soft hearts and strong spines. But I also want them to stand straight and stand strong for what's right. We live in a culture where it is wrong to say something is wrong. Not only is that wrong, but it makes it even tougher to do what's right. And that's why moral courage is the rarest kind of courage. Be willing to stand for the truth, even if you have to stand alone. Nothing is going to measure you, and nothing is going to mature you more than those times when life puts you on the spot and makes you choose a path of the right way or the wrong way. The, the right door or the wrong door. The right call or the wrong call. Because the choices that you make will make you for the rest of your life. Well, all of us have the courage to stand up during times like that. Uh, courage to stand up against abortion, against discrimination, against racism, against sex trafficking or sexual abuse. Church, well, each one of us who claim to know Christ have the courage to choose just one person that we're going to pray for, that we're going to go to, and that we're going to share Christ with. We are here to make disciples. A disciple should be like his master. Your master had the courage to leave the comforts of heaven, to come to a planet that he created where he would be ridiculed, rejected, scorned, and crucified so that we might have eternal life and forgiveness. See, like Esther, we need to come into the presence of the king, the real king, but unlike Esther, we need not fear retribution for coming. In fact, we need to fear retribution of not coming into his presence. God has issued a proclamation. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us are separated from God by our sin. God has also issued an invitation. This invitation is written in the blood of Jesus Christ. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, nailed to a cross, inviting us into his presence through repentance and faith. Accepting this invitation, we can come into the presence of the king and be saved. The invitation's been written. It's been delivered by his son. It's been sealed with the stamp of the Holy Spirit. The cost of courage is great, but the cost of cowardice is greater. Moms and dads, Teach your kids and model for them a life that shows up when the rest of the world is hiding, that stands up when the rest of the world is sitting, and that speaks up when the rest of the world is listening. Will you, like Esther, have the courage to come before the king today for such a time as this? Let's pray. Father God, we give you great thanks for the love that you've demonstrated for us on Calvary's cross. We thank you, Lord, for this incredible story of Esther and it although it may seem unusual to see a book in the Bible that doesn't mention the name of Yahweh Adonai we see your hand in this God we know that nothing can thwart your sovereign hand and, and your plan and your purposes for our lives we know that you took that little Jewish girl and you put her in that palace in Persia so that we would have the opportunity to come to you through our Messiah, and through his sacrifice, and be saved. So Lord, this isn't just a, a sweet love story. It's your love story, and how you love us so much that you gave your only begotten Son, so that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, I know that there's some here today who have never put their trust in you. They've never come into the presence of the King They've never accepted the invitation that you put forward through the blood of Jesus. I pray that today would be the day, God, that they would do that, that they would surrender their lives to you, that they would make you the Lord and Savior of their lives because you're the only one who can save them. And God, for my brothers and sisters here today who have trusted in you as Savior, I pray that today would be the day that they would make the commitment to have moral courage, to stand up, against our culture, to speak the truth in love to a dying world, to not sit idly by 
and watch the world go to hell, but rather, Lord, to speak up and tell others about Jesus. Lord, we thank you, we love you, and we praise you in his precious name, I pray. Amen. If the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to you and you would like to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, you can come into the presence of a good and benevolent King right here and right now through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. He will wash you clean of all your iniquity. He will blot out all your sin and he will welcome you with open arms into his kingdom and to everlasting life. If that's something you want to do today, turn on your flashers, stay right where you're at. We'll come out. One of the ministers will pray with you. If you need to be baptized or if you would like some information on joining our church, feel free to do the same thing. We'd love to come out and and to share some information with you, help you move on your next step uh, in your journey of faith. Until we meet again, God bless you. Read your Bibles and obey it.